Okay, everyone, it looks like we are live. I wanna welcome everyone to a special C2C Care, Collections Care during COVID-19. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo, and I'm here to help moderate this panel. I wanna start by giving you a couple few tips about today. Um, we are gonna be broadcasting this, but there's a slight delay between our broadcasting platform and when it posts on live. So just be aware of that. Um, also a quick disclaimer that the conversation for today is based around COVID-19 and collections care. So that's gonna be our focus today. So without further ado, I'm gonna again introduce myself. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo, and I am co-chair of the National Heritage Responders. I'm also a contract registrar and I'm the community coordinator for Connecting to Collections. And now I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic over to Nicole Grabau. Hi everybody, thanks Robin. Uh, my name is Nicole Grabo. I am the Director of Preventive Conservation at the Midwest Art Conservation Center. We're a regional center for conservation based in Minneapolis and we work with over 200 small to mid-sized institutions. And I help um, organize educational programming and provide collections care resources and support for those institutions. Um, I'm actually trained as, a, as an objects conservator and I worked as an objects conservator for over 15 years before I transitioned into preventive. So if you have any questions specifically relating to three-dimensional objects, I would be happy to answer those. Okay, and then we're gonna go on to Tara Kennedy. Hi everyone in Facebook land. Um, I'm Tara Kennedy. I am the preservation services librarian slash preventive conservator at the Yale Libraries Preservation and Conservation Services Department. Um, so I've been there about 15 years and most of my background is in library and archives conservation. Though so most of the work I've been doing at Yale has been preventive conservation. In addition to that, I am the other co-chair for the National Heritage Responders Working Group along with Robin. And I'm also chair of the American Institute for Conservation's Health and Safety Committee. So my involvement with the COVID-19 um, discussions has been primarily about keeping uh, our conservators and cultural heritage professionals safe by using um, implementing good uh, healthcare practices, respiratory safety, along with our certified industrial hygienists who are on the uh, committee, and um, safety with using solvents. So happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, and then we're going to go on to Dr. McDonough. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Ann McDonough. I am the medical officer for the Smithsonian. And as such, I'm an occupational and environmental medicine board certified physician. So my specialty revolves around people who work for a living, the environments that they work and live in, and how those impact health in the long run. In the COVID-19 response, I'm also the um, emergency uh, public health officer. And so I've been giving both public health as well as working very closely with collections and building services and ensuring that we're keeping our people safe, um, as well as making sure that all the techniques and things that are done as a result of COVID-19 for either cleaning or disinfecting or other things are both appropriate as well as effective. Great, and then we're gonna move on to Samantha Snell. Hi, um, I'm Samantha Snell. I also work at the Smithsonian Institution for the National Collections Program. Um, in my capacity with NCP, I focus on collections professional development and also collections emergency management. So I'm the chair of the first collections emergency response team for the Smithsonian, uh, the PRICE team, Preparedness and Response in Collections Emergencies. And we focus on creating training and workshop programs for all Smithsonian staff, not just collections so that we can build relationships between our internal first responders, which are facilities, security, health and safety, IT, anybody and everybody that could be called in for an emergency response to work side by side with our collections folks. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a member of AIC and I'm on the emergency committee. Um, I'm a member of C2C Cares Working Group uh, Collections Care Network. I wrote down a list. Um, I'm a member of the DC um, Alliance for Response and also the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. So if you have questions about collections emergency response and the activities that were taking place at the Smithsonian to prepare and respond to emergencies, ask away. And finally, we're gonna move on to Priscilla Anderson. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Priscilla Anderson. I am a senior preservation librarian at Harvard University. And I also am a co-chair of the emergency team at Harvard. Um, we have been working a lot to build relationships and, and open communication lines with our facilities and operations staff who at the moment are the only people who are allowed on our campus. And so we are delegating things to them. We are um, making, you know, different kinds of arrangements for looking at, you know, um, doing security walks of collections, looking for emergencies that might be happening while we're not there. Um, we're also working with them to um, deal with books that are being returned from students who have had to leave campus and are working exclusively online. So um, we have developed, you know, some guidelines around that. And um, before we left, we also worked on um, some guidelines about hand, use of hand sanitizer in our reading rooms. So if you have any questions on any of those things, I'd be happy to answer from you know, the perspective of what, what we're doing up here in Cambridge. Um, I also wanna say I am the chair of the advisory group to Connecting to Collections Care. And I just wanna say a big shout out to all our community members who are supporting each other, answering each other's questions, feeling each other's pain. Um, I just want you to know you are not alone and you are a wonderful community. And I'm just so proud and so grateful for all of your, the kind attention that you're paying to your colleagues. Yeah, I would I would do a big shout out for that as the community coordinator. Um, everyone's been sharing some really good information, and this is all uncharted territory for all of us. Even though, um, you know, I live in the Florida Keys, we deal with hurricanes pretty regularly, and even you know, we're just kind of like I heard earlier today, people were talking about pandemic was not on our high threat list when we were all working on our emergency plan. So again, this is all new to everyone, and uh, the news coming out is constantly changing. And I think it's been very interesting to kind of watch how our community kind of reacts to all that news. So let me start with asking kind of a first question, um, just to kind of see how are people, what kind of provisions are people making for checking on collections, the environment, physical security of the building? What have you been doing in that case? And I'm gonna pass that question on to Nicole first, to kind of see how her organization prepped for this shenanigans basically okay sure i'd be happy to answer that um but first i should start off by saying explaining that as at the midwest art conservation center we are not a collecting institution we don't have a collection we're a support organization so we provide conservation treatment and, co and consulting for our member institutions so what we've been doing um we are in minnesota we are under a stay-at-home order currently um prior to that stay-at-home home order the museum where we are where our facility is located was closed, so we um, we actually had to leave work before uh, the stay-at-home order came into in place, and so because we don't have a collection, um, you know our, our situation is a little bit different. But I can tell you that I have been speaking with a lot of our member institutions, um, small historical societies, collections throughout the Midwest, and one of the things that is is a challenge is to continue to monitor your collection environment while you're under a stay-at-home order. And so, you know, what I would like to emphasize is two things. One is that while it is important to monitor your environmental levels in your collections areas, it's also important to keep personal safety in the forefront. We are in the midst of an emergency, and so you should defer to whatever your local guidelines are in terms of staying at home. One thing that you might be able to do, even if you can't access your collections directly, is you might be able to drive by the facility and just check the physical perimeter and make sure that there's nothing amiss. Um, so that is a recommendation as long as it's within your local guidelines. That's something that I'm definitely recommending that people do. Um, and in terms of environmental control, um, people are often relying on monitoring systems that you have to be on site in order to access. Um, your data loggers might not be the kind that you can access from a web. Now there are remote monitoring systems that are available. Um, the Hobo Data Loggers has a remote system, PEM2, I'm not sure about PEM2. Um, and I can't endorse any specific project um, product, but I can just let you know that there are options out there for instituting a remote monitoring system. There's actually a new company 
that started a couple of years ago out of Birmingham, Alabama called Conserve, and they're designed specifically for collections care, and they have a remote monitoring system. So I recommend that you guys do your research and see if you can obtain some remote data loggers that you might be able to um, utilize your facilities people to install those. And if that's not a possibility, talk with your facilities staff. They probably have a monitoring system in place. It may not be exactly where you would have placed those monitors, but see if you can obtain some of that data remotely, just to make sure that your environmental systems are where they need to be. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I'd say for a lot of our institutions, remote monitoring is talking to your security guard or whoever's allowed on that facility, that's gonna be who you're gonna be talking to. Um, and that's why having relationships with those groups or those people is so important when you're working within a facility. For a larger group like you guys have, Tara, what did you guys do as you prepared? So like Nicole, we had um, the stay at home um, edict put down a week after um, we actually were told to stay to work, um, work from home. Um, we were had a couple staff who were allowed to come in um, for the first couple days to do some preparation work. Our initial um, things that we did even the week before that was our director, Christine McCarthy, uh, put together um, a series of questions to ask all of us um, as uh, unit heads about um, getting, making sure we had an emergency number phone tree that would be activated as soon as that was put in place. That was incredibly helpful. Um, because I have staff, for example, who have no computers at home, so their only way of communication was through the telephone. So it was that is the only way I can keep in touch with them. So that was huge. Um, after that, um, we did some other things about talking about the possibilities when we were working from home, what projects we needed to um, communicate outside of Yale to let them know that we would be closing, because um, we do a lot of projects outside with uh, regional centers, and um, we needed to let them know that we'd be closing. So that really helped us sort of prepare, like what if we were closed for this long? What if we were closed for longer than that? So that was an extremely helpful exercise. Uh, so once that we were actually closed down, uh, some of the folks went in to do some extra protection for covering collections in areas that we knew were prone to leaks, things like that. Um, and actually when we went in that day, it turned out that the HVAC system was a little out of control and was really warm in there. So luckily they were able to tell the facility staff to turn that down. We do have security checks daily um, from our security staff that come in and do rounds. That's a huge help. Our facilities folks are going in a couple times a week to check on things to make sure that all of that is okay. And we have a building management system that's online and can be monitored from home. I actually do have access to that, so I can check in and look and see if all the spaces are running as they should. So we're very fortunate in that respect. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we've done at this point. Um, and we definitely will be talking about um, pandemic preparations in terms of emergency planning when we get back, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I think everyone remembers a few years ago when people kept writing the zombie addendums to all their yep. emergency plans, and I feel like this is like the world we're in right now, a little bit. I have, a, I have a friend who is going to tell me that he told me so. Right. I am <laughs> for that. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm it, sorry, I would like to open it up. I can tell people I told you so now, so <laughs> it works out. Very much. Does it, do any of our other panelists have any thoughts on this topic right now? Sure, Priscilla, go ahead. Oh, you need to. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things about working with other people. So, um, if you are not the person who is doing these daily walkthroughs, if you are in fact able to do walkthroughs, um, but somebody else is, I would advise you to have a conversation with them about trouble spots that you know of, places where there are known leaks that have happened in the past. Um, and also maybe even talk about what are the areas that are that have the most density of collections that might be at higher risk of let's say a water leak um, and or collections that might be more valuable than others just to you know if there's something that they can check just to make sure that that thing is still there <laughs> um, just you know, checking in with them about those things. And then another thing you can do, if you don't have anybody who is going in on a daily basis and you're not permitted to do that, 
you can be working on your emergency plan network that is outside of your institution. So you might reach out to your local town emergency manager or maybe even the fire department to just make sure that your institution is on their map and that they, you know, if they're doing rounds of the town, that they might just keep an eye out for your, your, um, your building. So just. Yeah, those relationships, if you can build them, I mean, now it's hard because we're already in the event, right? But like, this is one of those things that's gonna, I think is going to be a takeaway is any kind of relationship you can build with emergency responders beforehand is only beneficial to you when we're set with these types of circumstances. Samantha, did you have something to add? I did just two things really quickly. Um, for the folks that can still go on site, if you have facilities or security people that are allowed to be allowed onto site, you might want to coordinate with them to see if they could do a FaceTime with you while they're walking around so that they could share what they're seeing as they're going through your spaces so that even if you can't be there personally, at least you can see through their eyes and their lens what they're seeing as they're doing their walk arounds. Because fortunately we have the technology today so we might as well utilize it. And if you don't have great working relationships with your facilities or security staff, um, your facilities managers, you know, this is a great time to build those relationships, reach out to them. If you have trainings that you ordinarily do with your staff, if you have, you know, Zoom accounts or other means of doing virtual conferencing and video conferencing, set up some time to share some of that information with them through video conferences. You know, these are the things as collections folks, this is what's important to us. This is what we would look for if we were walking through those areas right now. So, you know, this could be an opportunity to have those trainings virtually with the folks that are still on the ground representing you. Agreed, big time. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. And I, I think I'm gonna get the bear in the room. So there's been a lot of questions amongst the communities and everything about how to treat our objects when it comes to this virus. Um, you know, it's, there was a really good, and I would recommend people listen to it, a very good uh, webinar with IMLS and CDC that happened earlier this week that is available for free. You can go listen to it. I listened to it yesterday when I was walking my dog because you could just do that kind of thing. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about it a little bit. So what's kind of, what are the thoughts right now when it comes to um, the quarantining of library books or other collection material within your facility? Who would like to take, start that topic of conversation right now? Go for it, Priscilla. Um, so for library books specifically, um, we are recommending that our libraries, um, there's the thing to do and then there's the thing not to do. So the thing to do um, is to listen to the guidance about um, what are the, the, the is the am amount of time that something might want to be quarantined if you suspected that it had been um, you know, contaminated in some way. And so we're listening to the CDC. <laughs> um, so, so, and really the great virtue of quarantining is that it does no damage to your collections. Um, there's nothing that's going to go awry if you just don't touch it for a day um, or even three days. So the thing that we advise you not do is not to use any liquids, any sprays, any fumigants or fogs, because all of these materials can cause staining and wrinkling. Um, they can cause the dye in the book cloth or in the ink that it can start bleeding all over everything. Um, you know, especially if it has alcohol in it, that, you know, there are many things that, that will dissolve in alcohol that don't in water. So um, not even the alcohol-based ones are safe for spraying on books. Um, the other thing that can happen if you put a chemical on onto your books is that there might be a future implication of wondering whether this thing is contaminated with a, a chemical that might have some kind of health implication. And what I can say is that in the past, people put arsenic or DDT on their books because they wanted to prevent bugs from eating the books. Well, now we're a lot more worried about the DDT than we are about the bugs. So, um, so if you can avoid spraying any kind of liquids whatsoever on your books, that 
that your your future self will appreciate it um and the books will uh be much more guaranteed to survive yeah that's um i've worked i've worked previously in my life with native collections and that's a huge issue is the arsenic on things you know what i mean so i'm glad you brought that up does anyone else have any other thoughts on just oh, go for it nicole yeah thanks robin um i just wanted to reiterate that what's true for paper-based materials is true for other types of materials also um we have learned a lot about um, different kinds of cleaning and disinfecting and the cdc has a lot of really great research resources about how to clean and disinfect high touch surfaces and hard surfaces like doorknobs and touch screens things that are touched frequently this doesn't apply to your historic materials those historic materials are not things that are handled regularly and they are things that will really benefit most from isolation Isolation is the safest thing that we can do for those cultural materials. If you, before going to, to clean or disinfect any item of cultural heritage with any type of solvent, including water, soap, um, fumigants, please contact a conservator. And uh, really what we're recommending is isolation. And as for the time period, how long will it take before the virus is completely inactive? that is something that we are still learning. So I think that it's pretty clear for paper and cardboard that 24 hours is a good guideline. That's what the CDC has been saying. And so we are listening to that and we're following their lead. But in terms of other materials, there isn't a lot of information that's out there yet. So let's just wait, let's hold off, and let's let the research catch up. This is really new, we're in new territory, and the safest thing we can do for our collections is just to isolate them. And we have a good opportunity to do that now with our institutions being closed, many of us working from home and under stay at home orders, leave the collections where they are and, and let time take its toll. Anybody else? I, I did notice in the chat, someone had said that the IMLS recording said in nine days maximum. I heard 24 hours for the initial like, try not to touch things within 24 hours and then like a 72 hour maximum, but maybe I misheard. Tara, do you have a thought? Um, so there's a lot of, of the literature that's out there. I've been reading a lot of um, medical literature about this. So some of them are saying that it could be viable for up to nine days. I know that NCPTT, when they did their presentation, said that. But it's based on research that is, it, as Nicole said, it's in its preliminary stages. And they're basing a lot of their information on how SARS, which is a similar virus in the same family, is behaving. So they, can, they may feel more comfortable saying something like nine days because they know more about SARS and how long its viability is on surfaces. So that may be where some of the confusion lies. Um, and from what I'm reading, it does vary on different surfaces. So if you feel more comfortable waiting nine days and we'll, I mean, by the time we probably return to our cultural institutions, it's certainly gonna be beyond nine days. So again, that quarantining, the quarantining uh, uh, strategy is still completely viable. And I think that is our best strategy at this point. Yeah, we have a couple people saying in the chat, NCPTT said nine days. So I think that's, and I think everyone's trying, you know, obviously be safe. You want to be comfortable too. You're not going to force, like a, this is an extreme. You're not going to be like, hey, intern, go touch that thing that was just outside. Like we're all trying to be safe and trying to be aware of, of what's out there right now. Dr. Ann, did you have any comment? Dr. McDonough, did you have comments? Or? Yes, so the nine days actually comes from a hospital disinfection study. And there was one coronavirus type, and it was not even the SARS type of coronavirus. So it was another type completely. And then also some of the coronaviruses that in fact um, animals can live longer in the environment. But the, it was, there was only one nine day, all the rest of them. So all the SARS types, the common cold types, those were all four days or less. Mm -hmm. So an, out of an abundance of caution, if you've got nine days, go for it. But for most of the infectious human viruses and all the SARS type viruses, 72 hours is the longest that they have seen for a viable virus. Now, on the flip side, even in the CDC, you can see that there is also a study out there and they talk about specifically about the Diamond Princess and that it has RNA on it two weeks. And if you just think of it this way, and I'll give you a fun thing and you won't ever forget it, but the RNA is like a fingerprint. If you found DNA two weeks later on a surface, you would not worry that you were going to get pregnant from it, right? 
You're not gonna worry about getting COVID from RNA that's just hanging out there in the environment. So those tests were not for viable RNA COVID virus. Those were specifically just showing that there's some DNA or some genetic material that is out there. Yes. So now you know, look for viable and whether or not if it's infectious, not just whether or not it was there. Yeah. Well, and a big this is why we should always listen to the doctors and not the conservators about this kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for making that point. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, a big thing too, that was part of that, not to totally rehash that C2C IMLS webinar, but they were talking a lot about different types of surfaces too, right? So porous, non-porous, metal, you know, like all those kind of things. So I think that's something to be aware of as well. Um, a large focus of that was libraries, which makes sense. It's IMLS, you know what I mean? And I, I was really zeroing in on how they were talking about dealing with public spaces, right? Because that's what they need to deal with a lot. So has there been much discussion amongst your institutions about how they're going to handle public spaces? Or have you guys been part of that discussion as more of the behind the scenes folks? Or is that kind of, Dr. McDonough is shaking her head. <laughs> Go ahead, Samantha. I was just going to say that, you know, our public spaces are and have been closed um, for the Smithsonian. So, you know, again, the spaces are not being accessed except in a very minimal way by essential staff. So there's very little risk, um, if any, uh, for any surfaces and things, you know, it's just general cleaning is being kept up just to keep down with dust and debris and things like that um, and to mitigate any pest infestations. Um, not to give them anything to snack on while they're wandering around our museums that don't have visitors in them. Uh, so we're just taking general precautions on regular cleaning for the limited staff that are available to be on site, but leaving things alone in galleries, leaving artifacts alone, collection items alone is, you know, as we were all saying, that's our best bet for just anything that could be there will be inert by the time that we actually get to handle them again. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big concern I know for those of us who are, um, the registrar's collections managers is when we look at pest management, we're really concerned about how like when these places are going to be quiet, right? And the pests are just going to be like, ooh, quiet stuff to nibble on. So I think that that's, those are things to think about as well. And as part of your facilities plans, you know, making sure you're talking to security and the pest people being like, have you seen activity? Have you seen anything? So go for and, it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. In addition to talking to your, your pest people and whoever's on site, it's also talking to your, um, people that are in charge of your gift shops, yes. of your cafes, of your mobile carts with snacks on them, you know, to make sure that all of those things have been taken care of because, you know, little critters like chocolate and candy and other things that might be sitting in gift shops. So to take care and make sure that all of those things are packed away properly in sealed containers, you know, preferably offsite if possible, but if not, at least in an area that could be monitored and make sure that they are sealed so that all of those things are removed and you know, give them less opportunity while you're not on site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't forget the employee areas, sugar packets, <laughs> uh, crackers, you know, creamers, all those other things that can end the refrigerators. <laughs> the one thing that uh, I wanted to add, this sort of, um, I feel like this transitions naturally into thinking about reopening. Yeah. And what is going to happen? Is that okay if I kind of go there for a please minute? Do. Yeah, no, a lot of questions are rolling in about that. So please do. Okay, okay. So, um, you know, the world is changing faster than I think we ever knew that it could. And I think that as, um, as public institutions and as arts institutions, we need to be prepared for things to be different when we get back. And I think that in general, our principles are are good and are, and are solid. Um, in conservation, it's all about minimizing handling. And so, you know, I'm just gonna like, I'm gonna preach that until the end of days. Um, you know, minimize, minimize, minimize handling. If we're looking at um, interactive collections and interactive materials in institutions, I think that there's gonna be a revisiting of that as our, as our institutions open up again. And again, we're gonna need to be mindful of high touch surfaces, any kinds of screens, doorknobs, and that there will be protocols that we'll need to put into place. I think we also need to consider, even before we go back and open, how large are your exhibit spaces? Can we maintain six foot spacing between individuals in our exhibit spaces? Are we going to need to go to some kind of timed entry or are we going to need to manage our crowds? And, and I think we need to be prepared for living with this for a while and the possibility that if the virus reemerges in a community or in the fall, which they say it may, 
that we may need to be prepared for a temporary closure um, in order to isolate materials that have been handled or have been exposed. We need to think really flexibly and, and prepare for, for those kinds of eventualities. Yeah, I, I really, I truly think that this is gonna um, change the landscape of our world for a while, because that's what everyone is recommending is, you know, when we, when places are open again, um, it's not going to be, okay, we're open, everything's back to normal. I think we're going to see a lot more of these, here's spacing, here's uh, interaction with things. Um, you know, I came up in the museum world in the O's, basically, where it was just interactives, interactives, interactives is what everyone's pushing. And I think that's going to be treated very differently. Um, does anyone else have any other thoughts about the reopening process or kind of what challenges we might be looking at with that? Sure. So when we closed, we actually did a staged closure. So we closed down many of the interactives and the surfaces that could not be effectively disinfected. We closed those down first and then we closed down high touch surfaces and then we closed to the public. And that's one of the things we're looking at in our reopening plan is, you know, having the flexibility or the understanding of how to clean those surfaces, whether or not you give the visitor the ability to sanitize their hands, back to the books question, um, because then they actually have control of how clean it is versus having somebody who comes in and wipes it on a somewhat periodic basis. Um, and some of the ways that you can actually give your patrons control over the sanitation and the exposure that they get, um, and then couple that with frequent or more frequent cleaning of high touch surfaces, um, as well as timed entry and many of those other things you've already mentioned. Yeah, someone just said that in the chat that would probably be looking at timed entry or doing stanchions, you know what I mean, to approach things just because um, it is going to be, you know, it's like I, I have two, I own two elementary age children and I know that even their world's going to be very different where it's going to be, you know, they're, they were raised in the world of hand washing, but looking at things now, it's going to be different, you know what I mean, regardless of what we do. Anyone and also, else? Oh yeah, go ahead. Just regarding timed entry, not, not only for, um, you know, if there is still a virus that's active or there has been a resurgence, but it's also a comfort level of our visitors. You know, will people be comfortable being in large crowd areas again? Um, maybe not for a long time, who knows when it will be in the future, but you know, maybe those timed entries will be part of the comfort level that we can provide for visitors as they're coming back to get them back in the doors, getting back to the collection items, um, but also doing it in a safe way for them and for everybody around them. Yep. There's a Could I say, oh, oh, I just wanted to say a word about hand sanitizers while it was on the table. Um, there was a study done at the Library of Congress about the effect of different kinds of hand sanitizer, different brands, different ingredients, that kind of thing on books and paper. And um, their conclusion was that water-based sanitizers are better for the collections. Now, again, you know, I am not a health expert, so I'm not weighing in on what's better for human health, but in terms of what's better for the collections, a water-based sanitizer is going to um, have less of an effect, less of a staining effect essentially than an alcohol-based sanitizer. Um, they also recommended that there be as few ingredients as possible, that the, the more simple type of sanitizer did less damage to the paper over time. Um, and I think the, the, the last conclusion, which I think is really important, the sanitizer should be dry. <laughs> so you don't just rub it on your hands and then go and handle stuff you need to wait for it to actually dry. And, and if it's dry, it's gonna have a much lower chance of, of affecting the collections. Yeah, I think that's something that even I, um, you know, I, hand sanitizer is something I kind of got introduced to with my children. And I was always like, man, this stuff is wet for a while. Like it felt like, you know what I mean? You're walking around, you're like that, that feeling. So I think that's a super good point that, that you know, it's kind of like regular handling of collections, right? You might want clean, dry hands when you're handling collections, so. Yes. Any other thoughts on? From a disinfection standpoint, hand washing with soap and water is still better. And so you want to keep your hands clean. A lot of those sanitizers will have a residue or some sort of emollient or something to keep your hands from drying out from the alcohol. And 
you know, that's all well and good if you want moisturized hands, but if you need to handle a collection piece, then it may be better to start protocols where people wash and dry their hands and then glove as opposed to um, using a hand sanitizer and touching anything they want. Yeah, definitely. Any other thoughts? Well, um, I want to talk a little bit about emergency planning and plans and kind of how people are going to be looking at this. Um, we talked a little bit before about how, you know, when we're looking at our threat levels, because when you, when you write an emergency plan, one of the big things is you look at threats, right? And knowing that, you know, like I'm in the Southeast, hurricane was always number one, because that's just what we dealt with. But how do you guys think that this is going to change the world of emergency plan developing and, and everything else? I know, big question. <laughs> But it is. And that's actually one of the things that a lot of people are working on right now because they're home, right? So what are you guys' thoughts on that? Well, this is Sam. Um, we've had this discussion around within the Smithsonian and with other colleagues outside the SI. And, you know, a lot of us have emergency plans in different forms and, you know, different levels of detail and things like that. But at the end of the day, the risks and the threats are the same. It's just in how we're going to approach them because we as collections people are probably not gonna be the first responders on site. We are not gonna be allowed in until the area is safe, unless it, you know, until it has been deemed you know, safe to reoccupy, the health and safety folks have signed off on it, the security, you know, police, EMS, all those guys have signed off on it. Then we'll be allowed to go in and respond. So by the time that it gets to that point, whether it's a pandemic is happening or it's regular time without pandemic, but it's still an emergency, you know, you're still gonna be using the same protocols. Maybe a smaller team would be allowed to be on site to respond, but you'd still be wearing the, the PPE that you need, maybe an extra layer of protection, but that's when you would consult with your health services folks and ask them, is there another layer that we should consider at this time? Um, are there things that we need to have in place ahead of time for allowing people to be on site if you know there are orders that you're not allowed to be on site unless you have mission critical um, responsibilities. And if there is a collections emergency and you need to respond to it, then that's a mission critical um, emergency. So even though our plans may not have pandemic as a title or a word or a section in it right now, all of our activities and our actions that we currently have in place should be able to be utilized um, regardless of, you know, the emergency status that we're operating in. Go ahead, Tara. Um, one thing that we uh, just implemented as a result of this particular emergency was that uh, myself and my director um, quickly got uh, critical employee badges. So in case that there is a complete shutdown, but an emergency, a collection emergency happens, we are able to go to the university and get into spaces. And if we're stopped by the police saying, hey, you're not supposed to be driving around or going to work, we can say, here we have this badge, we're critical employees, we need to go to respond to an emergency. Mm -hmm. So that might be something that may change in that the level of um, security that some of your collection staff have may um, give you, the maybe instances where you're gonna end up having more access um, just simply because things can happen and you need to be prepared for that. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Nicole. I just wanted to add also that I think one of the things that is really coming to light now, especially perhaps for the smaller institutions, is the need to have a continuity of operations plan. Yep. Say that, go ahead. <laughs> for extended closures. Um, it's something that might not necessarily have been on anyone's radar before now, but boy, it's sure on our radar now, and we are all learning lessons really fast. And so what I would say is, again, to emphasize, let's take advantage of this valuable time and let's you know, write down everything that we're learning because in 10 years or in 15 years, there are gonna be different people in these positions who might not have had the experiences that we are having. So let's improve our policies and let's plan. Obviously, you know, every situation is different, but trying to, um, you know, to put down what Tara was saying about having, you know, badges for people who are essential personnel and just thinking about what are the essential services that we need to be able to, to do, you know, in the event of an extended closure. Um, I think those things are just gonna, I think, I think that we're gonna see emergency planning have a real like uh, renaissance and a real like improvement because of everything that we're all going through. And the fact that we're all going through it simultaneously is 
horrible, but it's also great because we can communicate with each other and learn from each other and we can, we can all go through this together. Yeah, I think that that's a super good point is I know after um, hurricane seasons, it's like all of a sudden everyone has like great emergency plans in Florida because like we just went through this event and it's everyone's like, we know what to do now, you know what I mean? Because of the timing, but because this is a worldwide event, basically, it's going to be on, obviously on the front of everyone's mind. And also to your point on creating coops, I think in many places, emergency plans are just turning into coops, which they kind of should be, right? Because coops basically talk about, there's obviously the salvage part, which is unique to our community, but looking at just, you know, operations and all these other little factors that go into your institution, I think many places they're kind of becoming overall a coop as compared to an emergency plan is what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. and one of the, one of the positives that's um, hopefully going to come out of all this is something that we preach all the time, which is collections emergency management is everybody's responsibility every day. So it should be part of daily collections care and management. It is not just for May Day. It is not just a once a year kind of thing to check the box. It's in every action that we take to, it's all preventative care. It's all preventive conservation to take care of the collections. And part of that is collections emergency management and thinking about those risks, walking your collection areas and seeing, you know, thinking about different, all the different risks that could be happening in those areas and trying to address them ahead of time. So hopefully more people will be thinking about it on a regular basis as opposed to just a once a year for May Day situation. Right. And I should clarify, someone asked what a COOP is. It's a continuity of operations plan. So, sorry, my husband's former military. We speak in lots of, acro lots of acronyms around my house. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, talking a little bit more about that, is, are, are you all actively working on your emergency plans right now? Or is that something that's part of kind of what you're working on at home or? So for us, um, we actually looked at, we had a, um, a directive that was an emergency plan, but the specific portion for a pandemic plan was about maybe three quarters of a page. And it talked about many of the different things you should think of, but it didn't actually bring together the various stakeholders within our museums um, to look at that and make it sort of realistic for any type of pandemic plan. So we've all had the yearly issues with influenza and people do shots or whatever and you encourage folks to you know not come to work if they're sick and that hasn't you know and we kind of oh yeah whatever it's just another flu season um but we've also gone through zika which if you are bringing things in from other places there were a lot of tra there was travel bans internationally associated with that people worried about importing mosquitoes and where they had been um and then we also had ebola and that was a big concern, but because of the different characteristics of each of those biologic threats, the response was very different and its ability to spread was different. And so, you know, if you could recall at the beginning of this, people are like, oh, we should check everyone's temperature. Well, that worked for Ebola, but it doesn't happen to work for COVID. And so as you're looking at your plan, um, many of them should have like the decision point. So why did you decide to, not, why did you decide not to cover these particular objects with plastic, or why did you decide to cover them um, based on where what that biological hazard is, how it would be transmitted, and in cases where you don't know, you just need to have those lines there so you can think through, how did we decide this last time? Um, so when the next threat comes through, you can look at whatever evidence is there and how that bacteria or virus behaves, and then make the appropriate type decision. Yeah, that all sounds good. I mean, I should say real quick that like I, I am not a believer that when you're in, in the event, you should be like muckying around with your plan a lot. Like there's gonna be like things that you gotta wiggle around cause you got to, right? It's, you, you have to react, but it, that's not really the time to completely switch out your plan and be like, this isn't working. You know what I mean? Like, cause that just causes more chaos. So I think um, to your points, it's like, this is a good time to start going, okay, we, maybe we needed to do this differently. And as we've all said, there's probably gonna be a resurgence at some point. You know what I mean? That's how viruses work or these kind of, you know, pandemic, so something to think about. Priscilla, did you have something to say? Sure, I just wanted to share um, that one of the things I'm working on with a few of our libraries are tabletops, so ways to test your plan um, even in a remote situation. So Zoom and, and, and conference calls are a great way to, to do a tabletop, um, and so we, we're actually 
you know, a little bit COVIDed out. So we're trying to do some testing of plans against a other scenarios and we're taking some of this time that we have from home to develop those scenarios so um, I just wanted to offer that as some as a way that you can improve your overall emergency planning um, even if you're not in your institution yeah I mean and again like I've, I think I said it before we here where I live are hurricane like focus but when I go out to institutions and help create these plans or talk to people about these plans. I'm like, don't get that, just that. Fires can happen, floods can happen. You know what I mean? Anything can happen. So pandemics, who knew? So go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. I think this came up in the ARCS meeting that took place um, last week or a couple of weeks ago was that a lot of the institutions that had a really good hurricane plan are finding that some of that translates pretty well to the closures that we're seeing right now. Um, and then also there's, um, if you're you know, just interested in, in guidelines, if you look at um, the Canadian Conservation Institute has a note on winter closings, closing your institution for the winter, like seasonal closings, that has a lot of information that's really relevant for what's happening right now. I think that's note one slash three at the Canadian Conservation Institute. So you might wanna check out that resource too. Yeah, and that resource link can be found on AIC's website as well, underneath their COVID-19 resources. And yeah, that I was part of that ARCS chat last week, and we were talking about how, like, this is like a hurricane, except we're all at home and we have power. So those so, are, like, the big things that we're like, yay. <laughs> like, so it's all real positive. But no toilet paper. <laughs> but no toilet paper. <laughs> so, yes, that can be an issue <laughs> during hurricane times. So, well, I'm gonna move along to another topic, which is kind of connected to all this, but it's all just our working from home environments and mental health. And I think that that's a really important part of kind of what we're all experiencing. Um, I primarily work at home. So for me, it's like I have my setup and I'm pretty happy with it, but now I have two permanent 10 year old coworkers, which have made life very interesting in the past couple of weeks. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about just do you know of resources or do you know of things that might help when it comes to this whole working at home deal that we're, especially for people who we tend to usually be at our institutions, right? It's, that's our world. So does anyone have any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Nicole. Me, 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 pick me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to say that, you know, many of us have, you know, already found that video conferencing is a really great way to stay connected with your colleagues. Um, we've been having kind of like a, a morning check-in um, with the staff of the Midwest Art Conservation Center, which is really informal. Um, and that's just a chat. It's not video conferencing, but just kind of everyone sort of checking in on the same chat line and seeing how people are doing. Um, and as we kind of embrace these new technologies for staying in touch, I really want to emphasize how important it is not to leave anyone behind, especially in the smaller institutions. Um, you may rely really heavily on volunteers and those volunteers may have um, limited access to computers or um, limited interest in learning the new technologies and we really need to reach out to them in ways that they are comfortable with. So pick up your telephone, call your volunteers, check in with them, see how they're doing. And when you do that, take the opportunity to remind them how important our cultural resources are and how important the work is that we're all doing and that this is temporary and when it passes, we're gonna all go back to work and we're gonna go back to work together and be stronger together. So just to, to be cognizant of um, communicating with everyone in your institution and making sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate in, in the discussions that affect it. Anybody else have thoughts on working from home? <laughs> yeah, this is Sam. I just wanted to say just, you know, to emphasize everyone to be patient because we're all dealing with new stressors. Um, you know, it's different when you're, you're in your regular routine and you know, commuting and going to work and coming home and having home time, but when all of that has been mushed into one situation, um, it's very challenging and you know, everyone's trying to keep a stiff upper lip and do their best and keep projects going and keep communications going and things like that, but sometimes we just need to take a break because you know it might not be your regular break time it might not be when you regularly take lunch but you just need a mental break to step away and you know some of us are getting booked back to back to back you know meetings throughout the day that there's no break um so just taking a break for yourself letting a host of a meeting know hey i'll be there in 10 15 minutes but i just need to get up and stretch and do something else reset my brain for a few minutes so I think everybody, as long as they're, they're patient and understanding with each other and treating each other as fellow humans first before your coworkers and things like that together, I think that that's 
most important and just making sure that, you know, give your eyeballs that 20, 20, 20 break, 20, every 20 minutes for 20 seconds, look 20 feet away, I think. Doc, you probably could correct me. Um, but, um, you know, just to, to keep healthy for ourselves and our families and, you know, so that when we go back to work, we are ready. We are ready to be on site, but we need that time um, to make sure that we're pacing ourselves and keeping regular hours so you're not, you know, starting at crack of dawn and going until midnight. Um, you need to spread yourself out and try to keep, make a schedule for yourself for your own health and safety. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing with this is that like, I keep thinking, you know, because I, I get in my head a little bit and I'll be like, hey, I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done. And then I'll be like, this is gonna be a multi week event. You know what I mean? Like, I know here in Florida, they finally did a stay at home thing. Um, finally. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, we're looking, you know, May probably at some, hopefully, you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, I know. Dr. <laughs> Dr. McDonough is giving me some faces down in the corner. So I'm gonna keep thinking May just as baby steps. But, um, you know, it's stuff's going to get stretched out, you know what I mean? And we have to be respectful of people's times and their work conditions, um, kind of what they're dealing with right now. Anybody else have any, there's some really good comments happening in the comment section right now, but people talking about how they're working on yoga mats, how they're taking breaks, um, how, you know, it's like sometimes don't be online all time. I have to really, I'm a phone checker. I have to be like, phone's going away, going to go do something else for a little bit. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on how to take breaks or anything else throughout their day? Well, I think breaks are very important. Also realize that many states and uh, counties and cities have put up um, mental health checks and different phone numbers and other things. So check into your local resources if you don't have an employee assistance program. I know some universities do, smaller locations may not, but there are a lot more mental health resources out there if you start getting overly stressed or overly worried about your own health. Um, on the second part of that is, wherever your eyes are going, your body is going to follow. So take a good Google look at ergonomics and make sure that you are not in some strange position trying to look at your computer screen for hours on end and then you wonder why your back and neck hurt. I mean, honestly. So look at your, your chair and your, you, know, you may not have spent a lot of time at your home office. Now that you are, you need to make sure that you've got it in a place where it's taking uh, proper body mechanics into place. And there's a lot of resources for that. Yeah, someone just recommended to go fly a kite in the, in the chat, which I'm not taking as a euphemism. I'm taking as to literally go fly a kite. So keep that in mind. Um, and that conference calls can be a good time for a walk. I agree. If you're on an audio conference call, those are great to walk on. I walk my dog multiple times a day now. And um, those are great times to go walking around as well. Um, so we had a really interesting question come in on the chat that I kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on. So what happens if there's a collection emergency during the pandemic. Oh, Tara, do you have thoughts? Oh, I'm mute. No, I know. No, I'm, yeah, I'm gathering my thoughts. Um, good question. Um, Priscilla and I might be able to talk about this because you started to unmute. Because um, I actually don't really know what we're going to do. <laughs> um, certainly, we have our emergency plan and we know what steps we're supposed to take in case, in case of an emergency. And in our particular instance, depending on the emergency, it's usually water. Um, depending on the severity of it, we usually contact um, a disaster uh, recovery company to come collect the materials and bring them to facilities for vacuum freeze drying and that sort of thing. But it really will depend on, on the situation. Um, I'm hoping that this won't happen. But this is partially why having the critical employee um, badge is important. Um, so we have at least two of us that um, in the preservation department that can go. There were others who we were going to also schedule on. I think two, three more additional people were supposed to get those critical employee badges, but we didn't get it in time before the ID um, center closed, unfortunately. So um, if you do have to go into a space, I mean, it's now been several weeks. So in terms of it being contaminated, I wouldn't consider that to be a huge um, worry, but you are going to be wearing personal protective equipment in most cases anyway, depending on what's going on. You're probably going to wear gloves. If there's a possibility of mold, you're going to be wearing an N95 respirator if you still have any and you didn't give them all the way to your healthcare facilities like we did. Um, so I think some of it will already kind of the protocols we have in place for emergency response will already kind of lend themselves to the situation in terms of uh, the pandemic. 
but yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of like if you, whatever personnel you have that's ab available to go, those are the people who you're going to have to rely on. And I think it's about training in place and people being prepared and people kind of um, and people following the um, emergency plan that you've put in place and the protocols you've put in place. Um, Priscilla, I'm, you probably have other comments about this. I'm sure. Actually, um, we have thought it through with some of our libraries, and it's very similar to what you've just said. I just have a couple of things to add. Um, one would be that our normal practice would be for our emergency team to bring more than one person on site. So because when there's an emergency, you have maybe half your brain power. And so having two people, the buddy system really works. But we're probably going to cut back that to one because we want to make, maintain social distancing and as expose as few people as possible. Um, we are also, we're bypassing the part of our phone tree that, that you know, where a staff member might discover the incident. So we've actually simplified the phone tree to its operations or security that's calling us. So there are only a couple of numbers that might be calling us that has, that has helped us to um, just make it simpler and having you know having things be as clear and simple as possible when we're already under stress is a way to help guarantee our success um, we also are likely limiting the people who would respond to a water emergency to people who have been properly fit tested for n95s because um, even if you have one, if you haven't been properly tested, um, at least for our health and safety uh, department, it's, um, it's not recommended that we work under a situation where we have not been properly tested. So we're going to limit it to the people who have been tested. Oh, I got a, a thumbs up from Dr. McDonough. <laughs> Two thumbs up. <laughs> um, I think think oh yes and then about the vendors so I contacted three of our vendors and I said are you in business and would you respond to a collections emergency do you have the bandwidth the capacity uh, the staffing to be able to do that and um, they all said uh, yes we are in business because we are essential businesses and they said yes uh, we would be able to respond in some way, even if it was just to assess the situation. So um, we know we can count on our vendors to help us. And so we have now refined our plan to be even simpler to say that, you know, unless it's just a couple of books, we're probably going to be calling in our vendor. So, um, and then just to echo again what Sam was talking about, um, going through with a cell phone on video and having a collection manager or some a decision maker, the you know the the director on that on that call so they can see what you're seeing. We're definitely going to have that be part of our practice if we do have to do an on-site response. Someone, well, two points, what you said, contacting those vendors is an excellent idea of just calling them and being like, are you in business? You know what I mean? Because you're right. They, most of them are probably are considered essential, but that is a super good idea of just calling them and being like, hey, we were just curious if you have a prior relationship with them. Um, the other thing is that earlier in the talk, someone had commented about looking at our recovery teams and if you're making changes to them right now to see like who can access and who can't. I think that's another good thing to really think about is who can you access? Do you need as many people as you noted? And just kind of who is actually there in time of emergency that you can get? Because um, again, I, I keep talking about hurricanes just because this is where I live. But you know, we've always talked about the deal of like, if we were cut off, if you're taken somewhere and you have to go somewhere else, no one can have access to your institution, right? But we're all staying at home. So it's different how we're looking at who can access the institution and who can't. So, well, it is three o'clock. Surprisingly, I know, <laughs> like, it was a quick hour. Um, so just real quick, I want to thank all of our panelists for taking an hour today just to talk. I really appreciate it. I, I want to say thank you to all of our people who have been chatting right in the, in the stream. Really appreciated it. We have recorded this. We are planning it and putting it up on the AIC YouTube channel probably in a day or so. 
So keep an eye out for that. And if you'd like us to do more things like this, um, go ahead and shoot us an email over to c2cc at culturalheritage.org. We can see about arranging more of these um, throughout the next couple weeks, months, however long this ends. And I'm gonna see if any of our panelists have any last minute thoughts they'd like to pass along to the audience. Anybody wanna say anything? Be safe and be patient. <laughs> be patient. <laughs> Pretty much. All I'm right. Handling. <laughs> yeah. Wash your hands. <laughs> Stay six feet away from people. All that normal stuff. <laughs> Everyone, thank you again. Be safe, and we will see you all soon. Take care. <laughs>